Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We will begin the meeting shortly. Bienvenidos a todos. Comenzaremos en un momento. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Bienvenidos a todos y gracias por acompañarnos esta noche. Tonight's meeting will be conducted in both English and Spanish and we will provide live interpretation in both directions. Esta noche la reunión se llevará a cabo en inglés y español, proporcionaremos interpretación en vivo para ambas idiomas. For our English speaking members of the community, we ask that you follow these instructions for live interpretation. You can listen to the English interpretation simultaneously from this virtual meeting. On your screen at the bottom of the center, you will have a button in the shape of a globe with options for interpretation. Click on the globe and select the English language. At this point, you will start listening to the simultaneous interpretation in English. And for our Spanish speaking audience, we ask that you follow these instructions. Para nuestros miembros de la comunidad que hablan español, sigan las siguientes instrucciones. Usted puede escuchar la interpretación al español simultáneamente de las reuniones de Adams 14 en línea. En su pantalla, en la parte inferior central, Tendrá un botón en forma de globo con opciones para interpretación. Haga clic en un globo y seleccione el idioma español. En ese momento comenzará a escuchar la interpretación simultánea. And now, thank you very much, and we will hand over the meeting to President Lewis. Muchas gracias, y ahora les daremos el tiempo a la Presidenta Lewis. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Ramona Lewis, Board President for Adams County School District 14. Thank you for joining us this afternoon as we conduct the final interview with our finalist for the position of superintendent, Dr. Carla Loria. Dr. Loria is currently the chief academic officer for the Clark County School District in Las Vegas, Nevada, the fifth largest school district in the United States. She is one of two finalists the board identified last week after an extensive search process that started four months ago. In partnership with our search firm, JG Consulting and the Adams 14 community, a comprehensive leadership profile identifying the characteristics and traits of the next superintendent was created based on input received from Adams 14 students, teachers, staff, parents, and other community members at seven public forums. That leadership profile was then used to guide the identification of finalists from an impressive group of 34 applicants representing 12 states. While that part of the search process must be done confidentially, the board has endeavored to move forward with as much transparency as state, allow, state law allows. Earlier this week, we hosted a community forum to introduce the finalists and invite feedback. One of our finalists unexpectedly withdrew after the community forum, but we are very excited to be here this afternoon with Dr. Loria. Individuals from within and outside the district have provided feedback on her candidacy, and we have worked hard to prepare questions for the interview today, which reflect the community's input. Welcome back, Dr. Loria. We look forward to hearing additional information about your experiences this afternoon. Would you please, in oh, there she is, okay, <laughs> great. First, I'd like to ask each of our board members to introduce themselves before we begin the formal interview process. Hi, everyone. My name is Renee Lovato, Vice President. Hello. Hello, my name is Connie Quintana, Treasurer of uh, Adams 14 School Board. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Zubia, and I'm the Secretary of the Board. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Janet Estrada, School Board Director on Adams 14 School Board. 
Thank you all. This afternoon, we will ask Dr. Loria four questions during the first hour of our time together. Two will be in English and two in Spanish. After that time, board members may ask follow-up questions or ask additional questions that we have prepared. Once the interview is complete, the board will adjourn to executive session with council. The next step in the search process is appointment of the new superintendent, and we set aside time to consider that at a special board meeting on May 14th, 2021. Dr. Loria, once again, welcome. You will have 10 minutes to answer each of the first four questions. Monica Avena, our administrative assistant, will be the timekeeper. Before we begin with questions, for the benefit of members of the public, who may be joining us for the first time, would you please provide us with a brief three-minute introduction? <clears throat> oh, you are on mute. I am so sorry. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. um, Madam President Lewis. Um, my name, again, Carla Loria. I have been an educator for more than 30 years. Uh, the last 13 of those um, 30 years have been as an administrator at the cabinet level of superintendents. I have had different roles uh, at the cabinet level after being a teacher and a principal. And in each one of those roles, I have really prided myself about engaging communities, engaging with all stakeholders and collaborating. I, um, I am looking forward to this conversation to um, hopefully having the opportunity to serve for Adams 14. I believe that my experiences have prepared me for a role in which uh, they really collaboration is, is pivotal, is needed and uh, in turnaround situations. I have um, most of my career, more than 20 years have been in Title I schools and in communities that are um, really um, impacted by social issues uh, and hardworking individuals, hardworking families. And that's my passion. I want to work with uh, families. I want to make sure that before I am gone, I am leaving a legacy of improvement for students because the students deserve it. Uh, my motto and what I tell my principals and uh, my colleagues is we do have only one year to make it right for a second grader, for a 10th grader, or uh, for any child because they only have one year in that grade. So I look forward to working with all of you to getting to know you and to allow you to, to, um, to know me as well so that we can together make Adams 14 the best place for our students. Thank you, Dr. Loria. Now I will ask the first of our four questions. In the community forum, you highlighted performance gains achieved under your leadership. Can you tell us about the work you did that supported those results? Also, please describe specific strategies you know improve student competency in reading and math. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, I have actually been in all my positions. I have had a track record of improving student achievement. Um, I shared earlier this week about um, me being a principal. I was appointed principal of the uh, one of the two lowest performing schools in the district in North Carolina. Uh, we started, it was a school actually that was in a turnaround situation. Uh, we started a Spanish immersion program uh, for um, our students and the goal was to ensure that students would grow up um, or go through elementary and beyond with two languages. In, um, at that school, we um, really collaborated uh, in a, we actually took several steps. The first step was analyzing student data. It was a school, uh, more than 90% of the students were minority, 100% um, of the students were um, eligible for free and reduced lunch. And we looked at the 
uh, uh, their data, uh, but we went beyond standardized assessments. It was all kinds of, of data going beyond um, assessments. We looked at their experiences in the classroom. We looked at the attendance of the students because we do know that attendance and being present in school is uh, highly correlated with student achievement. We also looked at suspensions and, um, and we uh, also looked at what were the skills that we were sending our students with to be successful in sixth grade. In, in the sixth grade, yes, in the middle school. We also had a dismal, um, there's no other word to describe it, it was a dismal parents involvement. Parents were not feeling comfortable coming to the school. And um, quite frank, when I got there, I, I don't think that we were welcoming to our parents. So it was a variety of data that we looked at. Uh, we started a PTO or a PTA organization for parents because we know that our parents want to participate in their students' education. So we opened the doors to start collaborating with them. We looked at the data. We had um, different advisory committees. We had an advisory committee to help us with our budget at the school level. We had advisory committees to help us uh, even look at the materials we had in, in the library to make sure that they were inclusive and they were appropriate for our, our students. And um, we developed an action plan. I also at that time um, was able to secure a school improvement grant with federal funds. And I was able to uh, bring in additional monies to the school. And we focused on literacy and math and um, to, to start uh, building our students. So uh, some of the specific steps or strategies, uh, first and foremost, we started with a uh, with training for our teachers. We know that our educators need to be uh, the best and have the tools and have all the strategies that we can provide to them to, to serve our students. We provided training on guided reading and um, small groups and differentiation. And we also provided training on unwrapping the standards so that the teachers were well versed on how to unwrap the standards. We set up POCs at the, at the school. Actually, back then it was not even called POC, I don't think. Uh, but we had our teacher grade level meetings. And uh, we were, I, it actually as a principal, I, I was present there. And we were looking at specific um, data points um, like the ones I mentioned, even um, formative assessments, because we wanted to make a change for the next day of instruction. I think that if we focus on the, on standard, uh, the standardized test that we have once a year, it, it's already too late. Like I said, the students had only one that year and one that, uh, in that grade level. So we had small groups instruction. We added 30 minutes to the day. And we actually, for that uh, period of time, we had flexible groupings. We had um, groupings where students were being um, scaffolded, um, some skills probably that they were lacking, but we were also accelerating students. And we set a, a um, expectation of, of uh, a, um, a culture of high expectation for our students. Parents were invited to come in. They were invited to observe classrooms. Um, even our board members were coming once a week and they wanted to also learn Spanish. So they were sitting in the Spanish immersion classroom. So it was just um, a, a, a real family um, feeling. We increased the attendance and increased 16 percentage point that first year. When I moved later as a, as a supervisor of schools, um, as a region superintendent, I've had all the way from 15 schools to more than 120 schools my last year. I have done that for nine years. And um, we started working, my team of supportive schools, on um, similar, um, similar steps, looking at the needs, but now this time at a different level because we're looking at the needs <clears throat> of the administrators at the schools. I think that um, every school needs a phenomenal principal instead of administrators to support teachers. So um, we worked on student culture in adult culture to set up expectations. We worked on data analysis and using the data that I mentioned before. We worked also on uh, teacher feedback and observation, making sure that our administrators were present in the classrooms, providing daily 
weekly uh, useful feedback. Uh, we, we say that if the feedback cannot be something that the, tweet, that the teacher can tweak in, in at least one day, it's useless feedback. So it is something that they can start growing little by little, but if, if think about having that type of feedback the entire year, how much better you can become as a teacher. And, um, and uh, we added also um, for some of the schools, we had additional time and we were very uh, specific on how to use that time. As far as the math instruction, uh, one of the great levels that I actually noticed in, in, the, in Adams 14's data, that fourth grade and sixth and seventh grade, they are showing a dip in uh, math and reading scores, but that was consistent with the data that we were having in our schools, our fourth graders in math and sixth and seventh were actually showing a dip in, in, uh, in math scores. So we brought in tutors to work uh, with, the, with the students during the day, it was not after school or before school, during the day. And they were working with the students, one to three students on a weekly basis. Uh, not working on scaffolding, every fourth grader had an opportunity to have a tutor in mathematics and, and uh, we were working on scaffolding in accelerating students. Um, another um, strategy that I think uh, worked very well was bringing um, student data culture within the student community. Students know their goals, they knew what they were aiming for, and they also were responsible for during the parent-teacher conferences, share with their parents, this is what I'm doing great at, and these are my goals. And they had their, their folder where they were having their, um, tracking their data, and, um, and we were celebrating with them. So within all these cycles, we were celebrating every little small thing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I have to find that mute button. <laughs> <laughs> now. Um, Dr. Lodia, your resume and what you've told us still tells um, extensive experience. Can you tell us a little more about your frequency and job changes and within your different district level, di different districts and different positions? Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you asked that because um, I interview also and I have hired um, many administrators and as a hiring group, sometimes you feel a little concerned about uh, people jumping from job to job or even from state to state. You start thinking, is she running away from something? Um, but that is absolutely not. I was actually running towards something. Um, I do have, I came, um, I started my career in Costa Rica. I was a teacher and administrator there. I was a professor at the university there. And I was offered a contract while I was in Costa Rica to come and teach in North Carolina. So I came and soon after I became an administrator, within probably three months, I was offered a position as an administrator. And um, I was then recruited by a superintendent for whom I worked for probably 15 years, more than or 13 years. As a superintendent, he went from North Carolina to San Diego. Um, uh, he had hired me as a principal and recognized um, the value that I could bring. So he asked me to join his cabinet and uh, we packed and, and went uh, after his vision to support his vision. And then he moved to Houston and I followed him as well to Houston um, to the point that um, even my daughters were asking him to move to Europe or France or something like that so that we could go. Um, uh, I was then recruited um, to, to go to um, Colorado and I really liked that experience and wanted um, a smaller district. I had always been in large districts and I truly wanted to be a, um, a, have that experience of a small district. And um, I went there, um, the person who recruited me actually worked with me in Houston. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is the second time in my life that I interview for a job because they always recruit me. They know the work that I do and they recruit me. 
And after that, I was also recruited to be a region superintendent in Clark County. And this was very appealing. Uh, it was 120 schools and it was, um, uh, they, the, the, the work that is doing, that is happening, uh, it's great work. Soon after I was promoted to be a chief academic officer. So every time I moved has been because I have been heavily recruited um, it has been for promotions. And, um, and on the other hand, I, I do believe uh, and I want to believe in the work that is done in a district. I do not want to stay in a district and um, just, just, um, just because it feels comfortable. I, I, I like um, hard work. Um, my husband says that I will never retire, and that's probably true. So I like the hard work, but I, I like the right work. And the right work is around turnaround. The right work is to be able to be an advocate for those who, for whatever reason, uh, will not be an advocate for, for their own families. Not that they don't want to, is sometimes understanding the system, understanding um, the, the systemic oppressions that we in our systems have. And, um, and, and that's what actually attracted me heavily to Adams 14. Um, I also, um, I am very interested in going back um, because my, our two adult daughters live in Colorado and um, I just became a grandmother. So me being a teacher and starting actually my first year as a teacher in pre-K, I cannot understand my life without being close to my granddaughter and being part of her, of her life and, and supporting in, in whichever way I want. So um, that explains a little bit of the movement. It has been intentional in a way. Um, I, I believe that has also given me the opportunity to learn how things are done in different places, um, different cultures, different areas uh, in the United States and beyond because I was also in Costa Rica. It has allowed me to uh, meet a lot of people and learn from the best and also learn what not to do. Because when you have different leadership um, styles, when you have different um, cultures in a district, you, you start picking up what, what you want to do when you grow up and what you do not want to do. And, um, and I think actually I would not change any of those experiences because I believe they have prepared me, they have made me adaptable, they have made me flexible, they have, they have allowed me to meet a lot of great people and do um, have an extensive network um, that will serve Adams 14 when I get there, if I am honored with the opportunity. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Esta pregunta va a ser en español, doctor, doctora Loria. So, uh, nos gustaría que empezara hablando con nosotros sobre el liderazgo. Ahorita uh, mencionó algo sobre el liderazgo. Uh, describa su estilo de liderazgo y denos ejemplos concretos de cómo ha conseguido y mejorado el rendimiento académico utilizando este estilo. Y también, por favor, denos un ejemplo de cuando este, este estilo no funcionó y lo que aprendió de esa experiencia. Perfecto. Muchas gracias. Sí, su día. Um, mi estilo de liderazgo, um, um, creo que lo pueden describir dos palabras. Número uno, uh, tengo un estilo colaborativo. Um, y esto creo que al principio tal vez no era algo que, que yo tenía tan presente que era eh, como algo necesario. Uh, creo que al principio, inclusive, cuando empecé a ser administradora, tenía hasta cierto temor de pensar que la gente no sintiera que yo no sabía algo o que no, 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 no tenía la respuesta para todo. Pero entre más tiempo estuve en liderazgo, más entendí que, que no tengo todas las respuestas y que tenemos que colaborar para encontrar esas respuestas. También creo que al ser colaborativa, la, 
las, las personas alrededor mío tienen la oportunidad de tener, um, de, de tener el mando de las acciones de ellos, porque no es eh, el, el jefe o la jefa diciendo cómo hacer las cosas, sino es preguntando. Uh, ¿Qué es lo que podemos hacer? Colaboremos, intentemos esto. Uh, si, nos, si nos caemos, pues levantémonos unos a otros y sigamos, porque es muy difícil el trabajo, en especial en situaciones de, de, de mejoramiento como las que tenemos en este momento. Otra palabra que puede, um, que puede describir mi estilo es eh, de servicio. Eh, mi pensamiento es de que estoy aquí para servir, Um, y en el momento en que yo siente que ya no estoy sirviendo, pues probablemente es el momento en que mi ciclo en ese lugar terminó y debo empezar en, en, tal vez en otro lugar a servir mejor. Um, ejemplos concretos han sido, por ejemplo, um, muy recientemente cuando empecé en Clark County como, como superintendente de región, Tenía, uh, teníamos a mi cargo en, en mi área, teníamos más de 120 escuelas. Y al ser un distrito grande, pues hay un, un plan estratégico y hay, um, hay um, capacitación que se prepara, pero en realidad esa capacitación para directores no puede ir a las 120 escuelas de igual manera, porque todas tienen necesidades diferentes. Entonces, uh, en ese momento, uh, en el primer mes que estuve ahí, uh, llam, llamé a un grupo de, de directores, de, uh, de, gente, de gente de uh, líderes de, de las escuelas. Hicimos un comité de aproximadamente 12 o 13 personas y el cargo de, eh, nos reuníamos mensualmente o, o cada dos semanas, veíamos las capacitaciones que... que que estábamos proponiendo para los directores. Y también al ser nueva, uh, hago muchísimas preguntas de qué ha funcionado, qué no ha funcionado, cómo podemos presentarlo. Y de esa manera, no solamente ellos tomaron, eh, tomaron las riendas uh, de, de qué se iba a estar compartiendo con los, um, con los otros colegas de ellos, uh, pero también empecé a, empezamos a ver que el liderazgo de ellos iba aumentando. Al tener 120 escuelas, empezamos a ver también de que ellos se convertían en líderes dentro del grupo de líderes. Y empezaron a, a, a compartir cosas que funcionaban en las escuelas uh, de cada uno y empezamos a, 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 a seguir esas cosas que decían que ellos decían que iban a hacer y, y, los, um, y, 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 y nos asegurábamos nosotros como equipo de dos cosas, que tuvieran todos los recursos para poder hacer lo que ellos decían que, que querían hacer y, y, y habíamos visto el data, habíamos visto las necesidades de los niños. Entonces, asegurarnos que tienen esos recursos, pero también asegurarnos de que son responsables por los hechos y que nos, no nos vamos a quedar en, en simplemente hablar eso. Um, otro ejemplo que puedo pensar es, um, dos de mis escuelas um, eran, son dos escuelas que están en, en problemas académicos um, serios y yo um, fui al Departamento de Estado de Nevada y me, me reuní con oficiales del Departamento de Estado y logramos uh, poder asegurar una, una, um, un fondo para mejoramiento de escuela de 6 millones de dólares para esas dos escuelas. Eran 6 millones um, para dos escuelas, que esto fue... Um, separado a los 3 millones que les conté la otra vez con, el, con la ciudad, que también fue yendo, hablando, colaborando con ellos. Con, este, con el Departamento de, de Educación de Nevada, organizamos eh, reuniones eh, cada dos semanas, cada tres semanas visitábamos esas dos escuelas, uh, hablábamos del data de los niños, eh, y, y el data, como les dije antes, de... de um, suspensiones, uh, de los niños atendiendo la escuela, eh, eh, todo tipo de data, no solamente exámenes finales. Y colaborábamos para ver qué era lo que necesitábamos 
um, traer a la escuela. Trajimos con esos um, dineros un programa de matemática, uh, pero lo que yo me aseguré con el, con el programa de matemática era que viniera con gente que capacitara a los maestros y que estuviera ahí en la escuela día a día capacitando a los maestros. Esos son um, ejemplos que, que incrementaron muchísimo el, el, el data de los estudiantes. Otro ejemplo que puedo pensar es en una escuela. Noté uh, cuando estaba visitando en una de las secundarias de high school, noté que los estudiantes a la hora de almuerzo era todo el grupo de estudiantes en un lugar era más bien casi que peligroso, que si algo pasaba era un tumulto. Y noté que los niños no estaban, uh, no estaban almorzando. En esta escuela en particular, 100% de los estudiantes tenían almuerzo gratis y estaban comiendo, cuando me fijé en el data, aproximadamente 300 niños al día. Entonces empecé a preguntarle a los niños por qué no comían y me empezaron a dar sus razones. Entonces... Um, hablé con los maestros y con la directora, de los, los asistentes de director de la escuela y organizaron al grupo de, del consejo estudiantil. Uh, ellos nos dijeron qué eran los alimentos que querían. Me traje a uh, servicios de nutrición del distrito y tuvimos degustación de alimento. Los 2,500, 2,400 estudiantes tuvieron oportunidad de probar todas las opciones que tenían, de votar qué era lo que ellos querían. Aumentamos uh, como kioscos de alimento por toda la escuela, entonces ya estaban dispersados. Y en el primer día que tuvimos los kioscos con el nuevo alimento, subimos al doble los alimentos. Y en cuestión de una semana, más de 1,300 niños estaban comiendo um, comiendo los alimentos que le estábamos dando, les encantaba, eran torres de ensalada que hacían, um, porque les encantaba la comida que les estábamos dando. Y no solo eso, también logramos de que en las noches, para los programas de después de la clase y entrenamientos, también tuvieran oportunidad para comer ahí. Entonces las familias podían venir con sus hermanitos y comer en la escuela. Esas son oportunidades de mi tipo de liderazgo que ha aumentado eh, porque, porque al ser inclusive con los alimentos aumenta la participación de los estudiantes, aumenta eh, eh, cómo ellos se sienten emocionalmente, bajaron las suspensiones y los problemas que, los que estábamos viendo teníamos mucho en las tardes, porque por lo menos yo cuando tengo hambre eh, estoy brava y todo me enoja. Y lo mismo los niños, y hasta las suspensiones bajaron. Así que... Fueron tres ejemplos, estos son tres ejemplos que aumentaron el, uh, lo, los, los rendimientos de los niños a través de la colaboración y de servicio. Gracias, pero um, le iba a, a preguntar la otra parte, la pregunta es si tenía un ejemplo donde no funcionó y lo que aprendió de esa experiencia. Ah, sí, he tenido varios. <ríe> sí, gracias por recordarme esa, esa segunda parte. Eh, Hasta un minuto. Un minuto. Um, una de las veces que no me ha funcionado fue cuando de hecho fui a, a, a tener una reunión con una directora y la directora en ese momento, eh, honestamente fue mi, mi manera de, de, de presentar las cosas porque llegué casi diciendo... Uh, necesitamos mejorar esto y estas son las cosas que hay que hacer. Inmediatamente se puso la defensiva, eh, no llegó mucho más allá la conversación. Uh, me tomó aproximadamente dos meses recuperar la confianza de ella, eh, disculpándome con ella porque fue mi manera de, de presentarle las cosas que no funcionaron. Y aprendí que que a los adultos profesionales y a los directores tenemos que darles la oportunidad de contar su historia y de decirnos qué es lo que ellos piensan y lo que ellos creen, porque ellos conocen mejor la escuela que yo misma, porque ellos están ahí bien. Gracias. Gracias, buenas tardes, doctora Loria. Buenas ah. tardes. Muy bien, gracias. La pregunta que sigue. Describa su plan de acción para los primeros 100 días como superintendente. Um, sí, perfecto. 
Gracias por la pregunta. Creo que, um, de hecho, ustedes tienen un plan también que yo les entregué. Entonces voy a hablar un poquito de ese plan de transición. Uh, es, uh, mi, mis primeros 100 días van a ser uh, sumamente ocupados. Bueno, creo que mis primeros tres años van a ser sumamente ocupados porque en una situación de mejoramiento en realidad es muchísimo trabajo lo que hay que hacer. Eh, son muchos sistemas los que tenemos que revisar, los que tenemos que evaluar y los que tenemos que asegurarnos de que son los sistemas que están funcionando para los niños. Entonces, primeramente voy a empezar teniendo reuniones, um, reuniones formales, reuniones informales con los uh, miembros de la junta directiva, con um, oficiales electos, con directores, maestros. Empecé eh, la semana pasada que estuve en Colorado, empecé un poquito eso y el viernes me fui a visitar escuelas para ver que ella, por supuesto, no entré. Uh, pero cuando había gente afuera, eh, hablaba con ellos para ver que, que, cuáles eran sus, sus percepciones de las escuelas o de, de los programas de educación. Um, fui a un par de negocios para ver, ya preguntando, soy nueva en el área, qué me dice de las escuelas, solo para saber. Entonces va a haber mucho de eso, mucha visibilidad, eh, eh, viendo la mitad de mi cara, porque hay que uh, tener uh, presente la situación en la que estamos, pero en cuanto seas eh, seguro, uh, de, de, seguro para todos, uh, estar yendo, reuniéndome en grupos pequeños, um, con, con, ya le dije, con todos, con, también con administradores, reuniéndome con uh, los miembros del gabinete para entender cada uno de los departamentos, eh, de qué están orgullosos, qué les cuesta o, o qué les gustaría cambiar. Um, debemos, el, 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 la, la Junta Directiva, de hecho, ha, haya presentado cuatro um, objetivos para el distrito el acceso a una instrucción uh, para todos los niños, uh, que todas las escuelas sean seguras, que todas las uh, escuelas tengan los niños acceso equitativo, a seguridad, um, también incrementar las, um, incrementar colaboración con el público, con las, uh, con la comunidad, con negocios y también trabajar en el plan estratégico. Yo, um, a lo que he podido investigar, MGT ya empezó con eso y ha empezado uh, con su trato de la Universidad eh, de Virginia de, para empezar a traer un, un sistema de mejoramiento. Entonces, creo que también um, debo, en mis primeros 100 días, entender exactamente qué es lo que se ha hecho, cuáles son los siguientes pasos, entender bien cuál es la visión uh, del, del, de la Junta Directiva alrededor de esos cuatro um, objetivos principales, a, alrededor de las dos estrategias que ya pusieron también, y um, empezar a formar grupos de colaboración para trabajar la comunidad y la oficina central en conjunto bajo la guianza de la Junta Directiva en desarrollar esos planes. También... Um, me gustaría empezar a hablar con el staff y con los departamentos para que alineándose a esos objetivos del board de, de educación uh, puedan hacer también sus objetivos para sus departamentos. Y um, un poquito de la pregunta anterior de mi estilo, yo les digo si ese es el trabajo que hay que hacer, ¿qué debo de esperar del trabajo de ustedes? Díganme ustedes, ¿qué es lo que tengo que ver? Porque cuando yo no vea lo que ellos me dicen, yo les digo, quedamos en que veía esto, pero no está pasando. Eh, los, en esos momentos es cuando se puede tomar la, la persona a ser responsables por sus acciones. Y uh, una vez que empecemos y que yo empiece a entender más la comunidad, entender los planes, que ellos me entiendan también, me conozcan mejor, a empezar a delinear cuáles son los siguientes pasos. Um, creo que mi trabajo es eh, muy cercano con MGT, va a ser muy cercano. Um, también mi trabajo va a ser entender la capacidad de liderazgo de las personas que están liderando escuelas, que están liderando departamentos. Y, y empezar eh, una vez así, venir al, al plan, al 
eh, eh, explicar un poquito mis pasos, eh, lo que he hecho a Board de Educación, a toda la comunidad. Tengo que ser sumamente transparente y, y continuar con este plan estratégico, ¿verdad? Um, eh, creando el plan estratégico. Um, creo que dos palabras claves para los primeros 100 días, visibilidad y um, escuchar. Eh, soy una persona que hace muchas preguntas uh, porque quiero entender de dónde viene la gente, qué los motiva, uh, cuáles son los sueños, cuáles son las visiones que tienen. Y así todos los conocimientos en los cinco estados que he estado, todo lo que he aprendido, eh, ver qué, se, qué puedo ofrecer a la mesa para juntos crear ese plan estratégico. Muy bien, gracias. Con mucho gusto. Gracias a usted. That pesky mute button. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Loria. For the next um, 20 or so minutes, I'm going to open it up to my colleagues to ask follow-up questions or additional questions that we have prepared based on the community's feedback and with our search consultant. Um, so I do have a question um, and I'll go ahead and ask that and then we'll see if my other board members have any additional questions. Um, please tell us about your turnaround experience and or school performance rating improvement. And you've, you've discussed a little bit about that, um, but how would you approach improving student academic performance in collaboration with MGT? I, um, thank you for the question, Trustee Lewis. Uh, my turnaround experiences, as I uh, mentioned a little bit, the last 20 years basically has been around that. Um, in, in, in the different positions that I have had, um, as a supervisor of schools, um, primarily after I was a principal and became a supervisor of schools or a, a region superintendent, um, I was always given a, the group of the lowest performing schools or, the, or a group that has a good number of struggling schools uh, because of uh, my experiences. And at all times, we were able to see significant improvement in the different areas um, and, and in a very short turnaround. I believe uh, in turnaround, it's very hard uh, to be in a turnaround school. I remember me being in, in, in my school, the lowest performing school, turnaround situation. The stage was already saying something different needs to happen or else. And it, it's hard work. And um, we focused on celebrating the little things that we were winning and making sure that whatever we bring forward, we must be consistent. We, we I think, have um, in education the habit of bringing the next new shining thing. And things change all the time. And teachers cannot adapt to the new program or cannot, by the time they learn it, the new one comes in. So I believe uh, one of the, the successes of turnaround is to do homework at the beginning to identify what strategies we're going to implement and be, and, and, and be very strategic on, in, on, on implementing those with fidelity. Uh, but at the same time, not being blindsided by, okay, this is where we're going, have those benchmarks that we are consistently looking at student data, observational data, and um, all types of data so that we can start tweaking it as well, but with that level of fidelity and consistency. Um, in Houston, I was um, given, um, the first year I was a chief of schools, I was given 63 schools, 25 of those schools were um, considered improvement required by the state. And we implemented a series of professional development that actually supported um, school culture in, a, in not only um, adult culture, but also student culture, the data analysis and having a cultural data analysis, which can be very intimidating because it's exposing the work and, and what we do, but it's okay. We need to get there to get there and focusing on um, professional development of our teachers and also 
uh, that feedback, constant feedback to the district. In one year, 17 of those 25 improvement required schools got out of that state. And um, a lot of work. Um, my, my role with MGT, I think, I consider myself blessed if I go there and I have them to support. They have been there a couple of years. They are experienced superintendents. So uh, in a way, they're going to be mentoring me and I will be learning from them and they will be learning from me. I believe that there's, there's the, we don't stop learning and I will be understanding the strategies that they're bringing. They, they have much more experience as superintendents and looking at, at, at situations differently. Uh, but I also think it is important with uh, my work with them to start regaining that local control because we don't, we don't need or want a, an external manager um, for very long or, or forever. So I believe part of that work is, yes, we're, I'm gonna be learning from them. They're gonna be learning from me, working together, continuing the work that they have started. Uh, ensuring that it's being evaluated, but we're going to gain- 35 seconds remaining. Thank you. But we're going to gain that local control. Thank you, Dr. Loria. Um, do my board members have any questions? We do have some time for additional questions. Awesome. That was going to be my question is if do we have time for one more? Um, you guys care? Um, Dr. Lydia, you you've touched on this again. Um, um, can you share your experiences about implementing program and or system changes that were advocated for by the community that you served? So, little little more information. <laughs> it's, it's yes. I, let me ask for a clarifying question, Trustee Lovato. Thank you for for um, for the question. So you're asking for. Um, in, for programs to serve the community? Yes, if you can explain how you advocated for maybe something that you heard from the, communicate, uh, from the community and how you advocated for that. For those programs, okay. So um, I'm gonna go back uh, to, ex to explain a little bit deeper um, the work that happened in these two low performing schools um, that I had. Um, as a region superintendent in Clark County. So um, how that came about, and it, it was actually interesting because the first week on the job, actually, I started doing my school rounds. And on day three, I go to the school and the principal stops me and he says, uh, very nice meeting you. These are my problems, right? So he was great at advocating for the school. So it was like drinking from a hydrant, to be quite honest. And the visit, I am uh, flexible with my time and, and the principals know that I, um, you know, that I will stay there as long as they need me or as little as they, I need to be there. So um, that day, actually, we stayed um, in, 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 and start diving into the data. The, 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 this particular principal, high performing principal, new to the school, he was in a turnaround school. Um, he, he was struggling with, um, with the communication, the support or lack of from NDE, because as I said, this was a turnaround school. And right there, we said, okay, let's call them. And I called NDE right there and I said, hey, uh, you know, I'm Carla Loria and I'm supporting the schools. Can I go to your office so that we can talk? And so we learn about the needs um, that way. And after I we were able to secure the school improvement grant, we went then to say, uh, what is it that the community wants? So the parents there, they, they had a strong understanding of mathematics scores being extremely low, uh, reading being very slow. This was a middle school. So we have students in sixth, seventh and eighth grade, very low in their reading skills. And also there was a great need of social and emotional um, support for the students. So we reach out to community, to the community, um, to the community resources and see, you know, which uh, resources we could bring for social and emotional learning. Um, the school actually in, um, in partnership with a community 
uh, organization, we are, and actually that has taken a little bit, but we are in the process. And my um, hope is that in August, we're gonna have a clinic at that particular school where students can go in and get services for free uh, with the help of this um, organization. And, um, and then we looked at when we said, okay, uh, the need is in math, uh, parent meetings, they were concerned about the math, the low math scores and the lack of ability of the students to do that. So we looked at the different programs. We brought experts in math, not only at the teacher level, at the school level, but also from the from outside of the community and um, in central office. And we looked at the programs and we identified one. So the next step was now connecting with that company and ensuring that what they were going to bring was not going to be just um, a sales pitch, but really understanding these are the needs and this is what I'm looking for um, in, in how we need you to support because we're, if we're going to purchase this, we're going to get what we need and not what the vendor thinks um, we need or what, you know, what, what's going to help them do the next sale next time. So um, I, I I'm a little intense with vendors, I would say. I think that that's a good way to say it because I, I do not want sales pitch. I want somebody who will come and listen to the needs and really uh, give us what the students need. And, um, and then the social emotional, uh, we talked about the math and then the reading was another uh, piece. So we looked at, um, to doubling the reading block that they had. So there were movements for the schedule to support the students uh, so they can, they can have that. But also um, the other piece that we heard from the community was to make school fun a little bit as well. So we brought uh, additional clubs and we were supporting the school with those extra little things to help students feel good with themselves, feel good coming to the school, um, be able to have some fun and, and be kids, right? But, uh, but knowing that our goal is to ensure that they grow um, their achievement and their learning. So um, I don't know if that remaining. the question. Yes, I don't know if that responds to your question, Trustee. Yes, um, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, board members, any other questions or clarifying questions? I have a, a clarifying follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask it in Spanish? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Trustee Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, habló un poco sobre cómo trabaja con la comunidad y, y con los jóvenes, ¿verdad? Um, ¿Qué oportunidades uh, cree usted que, que funcionan o que le gustaría intentar um, para que participaran más los padres en la comunidad o que participaran, no, no tanto participar, sino para que se escuchara la voz de los estudiantes uh, cuando tiene que ver con, con cosas como acaba de decir de, de los diferentes um, sistemas y, y, ven, y procesos que hay, um, ya sea para matemáticas, sea para algo divertido, sea para lo que sea. Um, ¿Cómo es que, qué experiencia ha tenido usted con eso o es algo que, que usted valora? Um, creo que ese es el centro de todo, porque si no tenemos uh, esa conexión con lo que es relevante para la comunidad, entonces, ¿qué estamos haciendo aquí? <ríe> tiene que ser... Uh, tiene que ser relevante para la comunidad que estamos sirviendo. Y, um, y lo que me ha ayudado a estar en diferentes lugares ha sido que, que las comunidades tienen necesidades diferentes y tienen uh, expectativas, no expectativas, pero esperanzas diferentes. Y, y por eso creo que eh, una de las cosas que he aprendido a través de los años es escuchar. Um, para contestar su, su pregunta, me encanta trabajar con los estudiantes y desarrollar el liderazgo de los estudiantes. Entonces, eh, en el ejemplo que le di del alimento en esta escuela que solo 300 niños estaban comiendo, um, yo dije, a mí me puede gustar estas tres cosas, pero yo no soy la que voy a estar ahí comiendo, ¿no? Entonces, um, cualquier oportunidad en la que los niños sean los que manejan, los que, los que están manejando el bus, como dicen, 
uh, es excelente y es una manera de atraer a los padres, porque los padres quieren ver a sus hijos um, y quieren ver que sus hijos están um, avanzando y están aprendiendo y cuando los niños toman ese liderazgo, eh, eh, están emocionados. Uh, si sí, me acuerdo, es más, hasta tomamos pequeños videos y pusimos en Twitter, eh, los niños emocionados enseñando la comida, diciendo que tenían a sus otros compañeros para las tardes, las comidas que pusimos para la noche, a, enseñándole a los padres. Eh, estaban, estaban ellos eh, maravillados haciendo, y los padres, tuvimos tantísimos padres porque les encanta a uno ver a sus hijos brillar y que están bien. Entonces, a todo nivel, desde los pequeñitos hasta los más grandes, si logramos encontrar qué es lo que motiva a los niños y les damos oportunidades de liderazgo, los padres vienen porque ellos primeramente van a apoyar a sus niños. Y una vez que estén, de este, que estén uh, seguros de que nosotros estamos ahí para ayudarlos a ellos, es mucho más fácil ahora en, empezar a, a envolverlos en otro tipo de, de conversaciones. Muchísimas gracias. Le agradezco. Justo. Con mucho gusto, Trasti. Subía. Thank you, Dr. Loria. Um, board members, I think we have maybe a few more minutes. Um, any other questions or we can go ahead and move to our closure? No? No questions. All right. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Loria, for answering our questions this afternoon. Um, do you have any questions for us? Um, yes, I actually have a couple of questions, so we'll see how many we have time for. So you let me know. Um, Monica, please be the timekeeper. So um, I would like, I was doing research. Um, I have been doing a lot of research around the district, and I noticed um, the ELL plan for the students, um, actually 10 years trying to get here and it was finally approved. So can someone um, tell me a little bit of the status of the plan? What is the vision? Um, I understand that it's moving towards um, having dual language programs. Um, I know DuPont is, is starting next year in a brand new building. And, uh, but what is, I guess, next steps for advancements? Uh, because we, the district, we are already taking steps towards um, that goal. Um, so yes, it's taken us quite a while to get here. Um, we're very proud of the product that um, we have now. As you said, um, DuPont will be our Du language school. Um, it is our hope that um, more and more students graduate with a biliteracy, the CLA biliteracy. Um, as part of that. Um, we'd like to see um, the programs grow to some of our other schools. Um, so right now it, uh, you know, it, it's where it is and we're, we're moving forward on the plan as well as we, as well as we can. We have um, some great people, um, leader, leaders that are leading that. So um, I, I feel fully confident that uh, we're on the right track with that. Um, yes, I actually read in it. You, I believe that this is on the right track and very should be very proud because uh, for a good product, um, it takes a long time to plan, right? That, that's not easy. Uh, you know, everybody would have one, I guess, if it were that easy. Um, and what I would think is the importance of start growing that, um, that program starting in kindergarten pre-K right now and growing it, but then having the opportunity to continue with the program and uh, middle school and then high school. So the students have that track. Absolutely. Um, in my, here in, in Clark County, uh, in my role, I would supervise the school for, uh, for newcomers. And one of the goals was to ensure that by literacy um, added to their diploma because it's, it's certainly Uh, like my dad used to say, having another language and being proficient, it will be like another profession that you, you take with you. So, so thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And do we, do I have time for one more? Of course. <laughs> There, I also um, was doing research and came across an article about the data dashboard 
that was going to be implemented, if I understood the article correctly, um, it was to support, to, um, to start with ninth grade or start supporting the ninth graders, the freshmen, uh, but it was a data dashboard to allow administrators and teachers have access to their data. It, did I understand that correctly or this data dashboard is um, something different? Um, I don't have an answer to that, but perhaps- It's a very instructional question that it's probably at a different level than the board because it's a different- um, Yeah. Perhaps yeah. one of my colleagues do. I'm not sure. Um, colleagues, do you have anything to add to that? Or maybe that's something we'll have to push to our our superintendent and instructional staff. And if not, that's OK, because I will hopefully have another opportunity. And as I said, I ask a lot of questions. I'll bring a list. <laughs> no, it's a good question. And just so you know, um, all I what I'm aware of, and, and I'm not going to speak out of turn, but I just know that um, one of the things that uh, the high school has implemented with our uh, moving of our principal from the uh, alternative school to the high school was that when um, the scores or you know the kids, the ninth graders weren't doing really well uh, academically, they uh, because of this they were able to add um, an additional um, period of um, assistance, I guess, for the kids that needed it. Um, so I know that. That's how they've used the data, um, but I couldn't speak to the actual dashboard that you're talking about because I can't even remember. I mean, there's so many articles I wouldn't be able to speak to specifically um, that one, but I just know that um, some of the great work that they've been uh, implementing at the high school was really to uh, focus on the fact that uh, some of the kids weren't doing very well, which we all know that it's across the country, if not across the globe, when it comes to virtual learning, right? And it was... Um, something that you know came out of you know the learnings during this pandemic so that i know but the rest you'd have to talk to the experts in that from our, from no, our... I, you know i real and, and actually i was uh, quite um excited to see that moving forward to data dashboards and and supporting freshmen to start with because it's for every student uh, or needs to be extended to every student because it's one of the levers, data analysis and acting on that data to support students is one of the levers that will ensure uh, that continuous improvement. So I, I was quite excited. So that's that's why I wanted to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? No more questions, Dr. Loria? Um, no, I think the others can wait. Okay, all <laughs> right. Well, um, before we end our meeting, we'd like to give you a chance to make a brief three minute closing statement. Mm -hmm. So um, you're welcome to begin. Yes, thank you so much um, again, um, Madam President. Um, as I shared in earlier this week a little bit, uh, my focus and my goal, if I am given the opportunity to serve Adams 14, is really to develop Team Adams 14 with a kids first agenda. Uh, when we are in a turnaround situation, we must ensure several things. One of them is that we have a comprehensive plan for improvement. And I think the district is having great strides and great traction on, on having that. Uh, we need to increase the capacity of our leaders. So that will be one of my goals as well, to ensure that leaders have that capacity and instructional leadership to implement with fidelity and with excellence um, the strategies and the plan for improvement. Um, we also need to realize that we cannot do this alone. So we need to build those partnerships and with all communities, right? The faith community, um, with uh, the businesses community, with anybody and everyone who, who wants to help and who can help. Um, I also believe that we need to um, make sure that we understand that changes need to happen. And um, because it, it would be insane to think that doing the same things, we're gonna see different results. So change needs to happen and we just need to embrace ourselves for that because it will feel uncomfortable, uh, but it will be for the right reason to make sure that our students 
have the very best and excellent instruction that they deserve and then and, and that we owe to them. So changes need to happen at the classroom level, at the school level, and at the central office level. So um, and, 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 and we'll be okay because we'll be together going through that change. And lastly, empowering that community, um, that community input and community support, uh, ensuring that they do not feel that anything is done to them, but they have been part of the decisions, that they are empowered to bring their ideas, and that we honor, you know, that collaboration and we listen. Because in many cases, we may need to say, you're right, let's, let's change here because they, they know their students. So um, once again, I, I, I am very thankful for the opportunity to have gone to this level. And I believe my experiences can help Adams 14. And I look forward to hearing from you and to, and to hit the road running because there's no time to waste. Thank you so much, Dr. Loria. Um, we appreciate your time. Um, members of the board and the public, thank you for joining us this, this afternoon. Please remember to watch for information on our May 14th special board meeting. We will now move into executive session. May I have a motion to do so under CRS 2464024B, legal advice, the board to conference with an attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific matters, superintendent search and CRS 2464023.5, superintendent finalist review and 4EI, Superintendent Finalist Negotiations, Positions, and Strategy. Motion so moved. Monica, roll call, please. Who seconded that? Um, I'm not sure. Who, who seconded? Well, with Connie and we spoke at the same time to move, to move forward, but I can second it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Monica, roll call, please. Ms. Estrada? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Lobato? Aye. Mrs. Quintana? Aye. Ms. Zubia? Aye. Thank you. Um, there will be no further business coming before the Board of Education this afternoon, and we will be adjourned. Um, so, board members, you have a different link for.